Good morning, everyone. Um, so I uh, have decided to, uh, I was trying to make the determination of whether I wanted to like write or whether or not I wanted to do a video uh, chat and uh, speak to people about what uh, me and our team has been working on. And uh, I just made the decision to do a video because I've been writing and uh, I'm just kind of like tired of writing, uh, writing and reading uh, different things. So uh, thank you for indulging me for a few minutes, just for a few minutes. I'm, I'm gonna make a short little video and what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to make a few videos um, over the next few days. Uh, one, I want to first introduce our organization to you. Um, we were intending on having a few community activities and we are looking at kind of redirecting uh, kind of how we're going to launch this uh, in the midst of uh, our uh, current public health crisis and so I hope folks are taking care of themselves and uh, really doing the work at uh, helping to flatten the curve if you will and also uh, ensuring that they're with us after this crisis is over because I'm very concerned at some of the reports early reports that I'm seeing that uh, black people are being uh, are disproportionately dying of COVID and so um, um, it reminds me of my study around HIV AIDS, um, how that has happened. And I want us to be cognizant. I think oftentimes we forget that the people who are uh, entrusted to take care of us as citizens oftentimes uh, forget about uh, communities that are marginalized. and. Uh, I just want to make sure uh, that uh, correct information is getting out there, particularly to black and brown people. Um, there is a reason why there is mistrust uh, to our public health, I mean, to our public safety uh, offices as a country. Let's just be honest. Uh, we don't have to go back fifty or seventy-five years uh, to make that determination. We can go to the courts and we can see the disparity in um, the way that we have access to the criminal justice system. Um, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, so I really want to take the time to introduce Lord Rustin and Bates. So Lord Rustin and Bates is named for Audre Lord, a uh, womanist, feminist, uh, someone wh whose writings I've uh, 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 read and studied uh, since uh, the beginning of my uh, understanding of who I was. Uh, I remember going uh, to the Belleville Public Library in downstate Illinois and uh, reading the work of Audre Lorde because I was so hungry to read about this feeling I was having. And she was one of the um, folks that came up. Uh, uh, Rustin, uh, Bayard Rustin, uh, He's been talked about over the last several years. His birthday just passed. I think Audrey's just passed too. But uh, Bayard was a man of, he was a man of, diff uh, he was a conflicted man, it seemed, uh, but very clear on who he was as a, as a person, uh, as a uh, gay man, as a black man, as an activist, as an organizer. Uh, and was just an incredible human being and I believe he was born well before his time, or he was born at the right time, but doing uh, work uh, that was pretty pretty revolutionary at that point. Um, Bayard Rustin is uh, a man who was very powerful, uh, was a man who was very respected. Uh, he was the arch architect of the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, where Dr. Martin Luther King made the incredible and his history-making speech, I Have a Dream. Three days before that particular uh, convening, which was the largest convening in the United States, I believe, or on the National Mall at the time in the United States, uh, a black gay man did that. 
in 1963. Uh, and as uh, if you saw the story, as buses were rolling out of their cities across America three days before the march, he was told to stand down so he wouldn't hurt the movement. Um, because the FBI director at the time, we talk about institutions, right? Uh, had threatened to, um, uh, if you will, expose Bayard as a, he was a communist, he spoke openly about that, but as a gay man, so he stood down um, without getting the proper recogni recognition. And the last person is Lois Bates. Lois Bates is uh, an incredible uh, individual who uh, who is somebody that one of the first people I met when I came to Chicago 13 years ago. Uh, we shared an office at Howard Brown. And Lois was always moving, though she was also very sick. Uh, and she was a woman, a trans woman who had served the military, who put off her transition so she could be a service to our country. Um, she was always a woman that put the world of head, head of self. And when I say that, she really did. She wasn't a wealthy person by any means. Um, and quite frankly, she made a salary that, you know, that many of us live paycheck to paycheck on. She was not, um, uh, uh, a person that was, uh, she was just an incredibly humble person. And um, and when she died, it was just such a uh, heart-wrenching moment because you got a sense of the overwhelming loss uh, that uh, the community would take on without her being there. And what an incredible loss uh, because she was such a contributor to our, our, to our greater society, not just as a trans woman, but as a black trans woman who lived her life openly and out um, and just was an incredible person. So Lord Rustin and Bates are named after queer people, particularly Lord and, uh, and uh, Bates, uh, Rustin, I mean, uh, were two people that did not work on LGBTQ issues, but uh, they took on the fight for a greater issue. And, you know, to speak on queer issues and at, at those times uh, may have been stigmatizing also. I don't know and I, I won't pretend to know. But I do know that because of their work, uh, racial uh, and LGBTQ issues are advanced because of them. Um, we stand on their shoulders. And so I wanted to name an institution that kept these people uh, within the periphery of our work. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the center of our work. I wanted their legacy to be remembered. And I wanted uh, young people to know um, uh, about these incredible figures. So when people ask, what is Laura Russell and Bates? You sound like a law firm. Well, hopefully it gives people uh, the conversation starter needed to learn about these three incredible human beings. So enough on that. So Lord uh, Rustin and Bates, our mission is uh, uh, centers LGBTQ communities of color, particularly black and Latinx people, uh, as a systemic and structural level change agent. We want to address institutional oppression uh, with institutions directly. Uh, that focuses on organizational development, advocacy, and activism to improve the quality of life of that constituency. And so what that looks like is, uh, we're gonna start off with three important projects. One, we want to, um, we want to increase the capacity of organizations, institutions, and businesses that provide culturally responsive uh, services to our community. Um, and what we think that looks like is uh, it's not enough to want to provide services to black and brown LGBTQ people. It's not enough to want to do that. Uh, 
in the healthcare system. You have to uh, actually uh, know uh, concerns that LGBTQ people have. You have to linguistically understand what they're saying. So there's a cultural aspect to uh, language also that uh, folks have to understand. Um, there's also this ideal that uh, that because a person is LGBTQ themselves that they understand LGBTQ health. And so we want to make sure that when people come uh, into a space, particularly around health care, particularly around criminal justice, particularly around education, in the critical parts of our being, that the people that are entrusted uh, to uh, provide such a service are keenly aware uh, of the questions that they should be asking. That, uh, that they know, for instance, as a gay man, that perhaps I'm a bottom. <laughs> that we understand that, uh, uh, that anal health is something that uh, should be readily looked on. Or as a person that is transitioning, that, uh, that medications are understood in a way um, uh, that you know, where contraindications could uh, be of concern uh, with other drugs that I'm taking, for instance. So that's one area. So we want to go in and help organ like uh, institutions uh, 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 knock down policies, uh, update policies where LGBTQ people can be included uh, in those policies. Uh, so we know that when we have great workforce, that that uh, means a lot of times that that transitions to having uh, uh, great service delivery. Great service deli de delivery uh, uh, oftentimes contribute to folks' quality of life, particularly when we're talking about concerns like uh, food and access to health care and things of that nature. So that's one thing. The second thing that we're looking at is that you know, if you follow me on Facebook, I'm pretty much a political, I talk politics. All the subjects that you're not supposed to, they say you're not supposed to talk about, I talk about. I disagree. I think we should be talking about politics. I think we should be disagreeing. I think we should be talking to those that we disagree with. I come from the idea that uh, uh, when we have elections, that when you have people who said who gave no uh, indication that they were going to vote one way but voted that way, uh, that we have a communication problem as a country being able to talk to each other. And so, like, I embrace talking to people that I politically disagree with. And I think that kind of uh, uh, debate is healthy, um, uh, obviously when it's done in a respectful way. But I think those are discussions that we should be having. But anyway, we want to have we want to build the civic power, regardless of what side of the uh, aisle you land on. Building civic power uh, and having strong uh, civic power means that people who are, are are representing you will be more likely to listen to you because they see you as a threat. They see you as a person to be afraid of, and they see you as a person to be accountable to. And so building civic power for black and brown LGBTQ communities is becoming essential. Uh, had we had that in the 1980s, things may have looked different for our community. And so building civic power uh, means that uh, 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 those who are entrusted to elect us are likely to listen to us, right? The third thing is that uh, it is abundantly clear. So I understand that people have this concept of uh, jobs training programs. And I always say to people, I don't know what a job, jobs training program is. As a young person who got my first job uh, at Chick-fil-A, I was ultimately fired. <laughs> I came to work with my hair, but that that's another video. But anyway, um, when I got my first job, I was trained on that job. So every job I've gotten 
from you know my entry level positions all the way up to my uh, director level positions, I've always been trained uh, for what the employer wanted me to do. Uh, there was not a one mass job training program where I learned from, and so uh, I want to get away from that concept and I want to get move towards a concept because I don't see job training programs. I, I'm just saying in the North Shore or even on the north side targeting white folks. I see it always targeting our community. And they go through a job training program with no job afterwards. False hope, and that is not like somehow you, so we want to also change systems that require us to be one way, and, you know, that we should fit in a box, but a more inclusive society, but in the meantime, we want to build our own businesses. When people came and immigrated to this country, who came here on free will, that is, were allowed to uh, build business and bring their services and their products and be able to build a business to us. And oftentimes, we come into community communities of African descent, sell those products to us, and then take them out of our communities and build and thrive in their communities. We, we can see their children popping up at Harvard and IIT, t t IIT today, um, based on selling us a, a you know a box of something that we could have bought for fifty cents for five bucks. So this ideal of building uh, uh, economic power around entrepreneurship and having an entity that incubates those ideas, whether it's a small business, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a one-time community activity, that we have something that can build, truly build jobs, truly build economic freedom. Economic freedom doesn't come from somebody giving you a job. We know that. But what it comes from is a person identifying what they love to do and then being able to uh, sell that. So I know many people disagree with the ideal of capitalism. I do think capitalism, uh, the way we do it at least, I think there's some problems with it, of course. But I'm not going to let that stop us from being able to thrive uh, and be able to stand next. I'm just tired. I'm tired of seeing that. So. What we want to do is we want to incubate people, people's ideas. I'm looking for funding. I've been writing since January. I'm tired of writing, by the way. So, grant writers, uh, hit me up. So, um, that's uh, one one idea. One idea is really helping people to you know having a place where they can come in and get trained on applying for a secretary of state business license. What does it look like to apply for a 501c3 versus a 501c4? What does it look like in uh, 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 certifying with the attorney general? What are the tax, like I want, we want to be able to uh, hearken uh, this idea that we, we win as a village. Go back to that concept of village because we certainly are a village and you know, that has been ingrained in us uh, from our ancestors before we got to this land that we and other communities operate in that sense. And so I wanna make sure that uh, we, we're building a service to black and brown communities to be able to incu incubate their business ideas and be able to thrive in that way. And I know I said three, uh, but four, it's really four. So this ideal of arts, artists, uh, in black and brown communities have led the way on social justice issues from the beginning. I think about Mahalia Jackson. I think about Aretha Franklin. I think about uh, the brother Bill Withers. Uh, got, but he rest in peace. Michael Jackson. These folks and artists from every spectrum, from performing arts to uh, uh, I think of uh, 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 Thaster Gates, who Thaster Gates, who lives here in Chicago. There's so many people who contribute to artistry with a message of, of civility, with a message of 
uh, making sure that we take care of each other. And artists have always led that led that way. They've had the platform and the influence. And so Fahrenheit Chicago uh, certainly uh, continues to be a part of my family, and my family is Laura Rustin Bates. And bringing back Art and Soul, where we are, uh, where we allow both performing and um, 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 visual artists to be able to have a space, that we bring some of those concepts concepts back. And so Laura Rustin and Bates uh, is going to be providing social justice movements. Uh, I mean pushing our social justice agenda uh, and our uh, calls for civic power through the work of artists. We have some of the most incredible artists here in the Midwest. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we're promoting them, uh, that we're paying them, uh, but also that uh, uh, we are fueled by their energy and we can feed them back. And so uh, arts, uh, in social justice is also the last project. So we're, we're starting off with a bang. Uh, you know, the idea will start Illinois and Missouri this year. And so we'll be doing some light work in Missouri. I want to be, I want to like manage expectations here. Uh, but most of our work will be centered in uh, Chicago for this year, especially since everything that has happened uh, due to uh, uh, COVID-19. And so I want to make sure that uh, things are uh, still in place. I want to make sure that uh, that we uh, evolve with the times. Uh, organization is only as strong as it is able to uh, uh, wield itself through uh, the controversies or disasters of that moment. And so uh, we're going to be shifting a little bit from our original plan, but we're going to still move forward. Uh, for, for instance, Fahrenheit Chicago, uh, because critical time and I'm guessing the economy is not going to recover uh, that quickly in enough time for us uh, to organize resources. Uh, so it's probably going to be a one-day activity, uh, just to be honest. So um, what else? We have a dynamic board of individuals. Uh, we're still looking for board members. And so uh, I am encouraging women of color, queer women of color, cis and trans, uh, queer trans men, uh, people of that people of Latinx uh, descent, um, to please uh, reach out to me if you are interested in our board. Our website is www.lordrustinbates.org. Uh, again, it's still evolving a little bit, so be nice to us. Join us on social media. Uh, um, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, and Twitter, Twitter. Uh, we're also looking for a uh, a uh, social media uh, or digital. I would say this a digital uh, organizer uh, contractor, and so someone to help out with social media, particularly someone uh, who has experience in that area's idea. Uh, someone who has experience in setting up webinars and things of that nature. So really someone to help us uh, think through our digital, uh, our digital spacing. So uh, and I'll put out a job description about that here shortly. But thank you all so much. My name is Anthony Galloway. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter now and Instagram. Um, Anthony Charles Galloway. <laughs> So thank you so much for uh, tuning in, and I look forward to uh, to going to going with you and to uh, walking with me and supporting me through this journey. I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much.